sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, ich darf Sie alle sehr herzlich begrüßen, auch im Namen von äh, meinem sehr verehrten Kollegen Herrn Malnibu, der gleich die Vorlesung übernehmen wird. Ich hatte das im letzten Semester Ihnen ja angekündigt. Das ist eine besondere Veranstaltung, die unter dem Mantel von Medizintechnischen Systeme 2 firmiert als Gastvorlesung und sie trägt den Titel Bioelektromagnetismus. Und ich bin sehr froh, dass wir Herrn Kollegen Malmibo gewinnen konnten, diese Vorlesung als Gastprofessor in diesem Semester hier an der RWTH zu halten. Ich kenne Herrn Malmibo schon einige Zeit und darf ihn kurz vorstellen. Herr Kollege Malmibo war langjähriger Leiter des Wagner Granik Instituts. Ich glaube, Sie werden nachher auch ein bisschen oder später im Verlauf der Vorlesung über Wagner Granit erzählen. Das Wagner Granit Institut an der Technischen Universität in Tampere. Die Universität in Tampere ist eine der Hochschulen in Finnland, die sehr stark in der Medizintechnik aktiv ist. Und mit seiner Emeritierung, und ich glaube, Sie legen Wert darauf, mit einer aktiven Emeritierung, äh, hat er jetzt ein bisschen mehr Zeit und kann solche Gastaufenthalte wie diesen auch wahrnehmen, worüber ich persönlich sehr froh bin. Die Veranstaltung, was im Detail besprochen wird, wird Herr Kollege Malniveau Ihnen sagen, wird in Englisch sein, das wissen Sie. Und es gibt noch ein paar Besonderheiten, die wir klären müssen bezüglich der Prüfung und bezüglich der Übungen. Da werden wir nachher noch extra drauf eingehen, im Anschluss an die Vorlesung. Da haben wir auch noch ein bisschen was vorbereitet. Ja? Zum Inhalt sage ich nichts, außer dass Sie den Inhalt dieses begleitenden Buches, des BEM-Books, ja, das ist ja in meiner Generation der Medizintechnikstudenten ein stehender Begriff gewesen, auch im Internet finden. Das gibt es natürlich auch als gedrucktes Buch und wir haben auch einige Exemplare angeschafft sodass Sie, wenn Sie dort hineingucken wollen, das auch tun können. Aber wie gesagt, bis auch online und die, der Link auf der Webseite hilft Ihnen weiter, dass Sie das auch mitlesen können, was Sie hier im Vortragsraum hören. Ja, zur Vorstellung, also Ragnar Granit institut hatte ich schon gesagt, daneben ist Herr Kollege Malniveau auch äh, IEEE und IFMBI Fellow, also sowohl in unserer Weltorganisation als auch im IEEE ein sehr ausgewiesener und respektierter Kollege. Sie sind auch Mitglied der Finnischen Akademie, wenn ich das richtig in Erinnerung habe. Also freuen Sie sich mit mir auf einen sehr hochrangigen äh, Vortrag in diesem Semester. Bitte schön. schön. Ja, guten Morgen, meine Damen und Herren. Mein Name ist Jakob Malmivo. Als Professor Leonhard sagte, ich war für mehr als 30 Jahre Professor für Bioelektromagnetismus in Tampere Technische Hochschule. Ich bin jetzt Emeritus in Helsinki in Alta Universität, aber, so wie er sagte, aktiv Emeritus. Ich will diese Vorlesungen um Bioelektromagnetismus für Ihnen auf Englisch geben, dafür, dass leider meine Deutsch ganz schlecht ist und dafür, was ist mehr wichtig, dass Sie möchten mehr international bekommen. So, ich möchte zum Englisch, to switch to English. I wish you very welcome to this uh, lecturing course on bioelectromagnetism. And uh, first I would like to circulate this list of attendants. It is not the purpose to take your names every time, no. I want to have your name only once, and I want to have this list, therefore, that when after some years Nobel Prizes are awarded, I can, I can check if I know someone of the Nobel Prize winner from the list. So please write your name your information uh, only once. So I'm very happy to be here in Helmholtz Institute, I'm coming to tell you a little bit more about Helmholtz as well, because he was a very central person in the discipline of bioelectromagnetism. So this uh, course will last the whole summer semester. 
and the lecture, lecturing time is, as you already know, on Tuesdays. There are two Tuesdays when there are no lectures. One is because you have the general meeting of electing some, some members to some committees in the university, and the other day, therefore, that you have some excursion, excursion week. That's how I have understood. You will get information on this course from internet. Uh, I just show on PC. There is a web page on the course www.bem/edu, and you find uh, you will find the information on the course about schedule and some info, for instance, info about the examination. The main topics of this course, they are bioelectric and biomagnetic phenomena. I will speak to you especially today quite much about the history of bioelectromagnetism. I'm personally interested in the history and I strongly believe that it helps every student to understand where we are when we know from where we came to here. I will teach you some anatomy and physiology, only those aspects which are important in the sense of bioelectric and biomagnetic phenomena. I give you some mathematics and physics which are essential in the theory. I will speak to you about the independence of bioelectricity and biomagnetism. This is a very important issue in the uh, discipline. I will teach you about the methods to understand and design leads for measurements and stimulation. I will teach you the principle of reciprocity and I will give you some clinical applications. But mainly this course discusses a theory, not too much the clinical applications. After this course, you should understand the generation and behavior of the bioelectric and biomagnetic phenomena. You should understand the relationship of measurement, stimulation and impedance. This is something very nice in the theory. You should understand the relationship of bioelectricity and biomagnetism. You should be able to design new measurement and stimulation systems for bioelectric and biomagnetic phenomena. And you should understand the clinical value and limitations of bioelectromagnetic bio methods. So I promise quite a lot, quite a lot of things which you should understand after this course. So as Professor Leonhard mentioned, there's a textbook, printed book, but uh, this is also available on the internet. Actually, I think this was the first scientific book which was in general available free of charge from internet. I actually wrote the HTML code by myself, enjoyed doing that work, it was a long work, but anyhow. So from the book on the internet you can find uh, quite the information what I will be lecture here. I wrote this book with my good friend and colleague, Robert Plonzi. This bioelectromagnetism course is also available on the internet in the EVICAP portal. That is what we generated uh, in a European project. And actually I also wrote by my own hands this portal code. Uh, you find it either the curriculum on the left-hand side or just on the first page by clicking the 
curriculum, sorry, from here. So, okay, now it is here. Clicking the curriculum, you find what kind of courses there exist. There are several excellent courses given by colleagues on different topics. And the one here, the first one is the bioelectromagnetism course. This was recorded actually quite a long time ago. It was already in 2006. Uh, but the content in, in principle is the same, but uh, I have lot, a lot improved the course during these years. So just by clicking the uh, uh, icon of the course. Good afternoon. My name is Jakko Malmibo, and I will lecture you this course on bioelectromagnetism. Okay, I go home and let that go. Let that show to you. <laughs> So a lot of information is available on the internet. But I still very much hope to see you here on the core, on the lectures. I give you a very schematic map on various interdisciplinary disciplines to indicate where bioelectromagnetism stays. This is not too scientific. Please do not take it too seriously. If we have on the horizontal axis uh, various kind of engineering sciences, theoretical on the origin, theoretical physics, applied physics, electronics, and applied engineering. On vertical side, we have the medical sciences, biological and medical sciences, theoretical biology, and applied biology, which is medicine. Not too scientific, but we can say so. Now, when combining these, we get interdisciplinary sciences. Combining medicine and engineering is medical engineering, not too difficult. Combining biology and physics brings biophysics, and so on. Medical physics, bioengineering, medical electronics, and finally, bioelectromagnetism. So what is the message of this schema? The message is that uh, bioelectromagnetism is rather theoretical discipline. I do not speak too much about the applications. And the reason for that is that then I should completely change the contents of the course every year because the applications are develop developing. The instrumentation is developing so fast. Theory stays stable longer time. That is about the location or situation of bioelectromagnetism in this map of interdisciplinary sciences. What is bioelectromagnetism? A professor always starts with a definition. Bioelectromagnetism is a discipline that examines the electric, electromagnetic, and magnetic phenomena which arise in biological tissues. I show you the map, the map of the land, the territory of bioelectromagnetism. This is how it is possible to divide the discipline. It's a bit confusing with some of the terminology, but uh, please try to, try to uh, understand still. We can divide the bioelectromagnetism to bioelectricity, poor biomagnetism, and their combination, which could be called bioelectromagnetism with the same name as the whole discipline, which is usually called with the name biomagnetism. So this is a bit confusing, but please don't worry too much about that. There do exist in the nature, in the body of a, a human body and bodies of animals, in the living bodies, uh, tissues which generate bioelectric phenomena. We can measure these signals. Here are examples are brain, uh, the heart muscle, skeletal muscle. These are come to the lungs a bit later. So they generate electric field. 
which we can measure. Always when there exists electricity, electric current, it induces magnetic field, said Mr. Maxwell sometimes. Therefore, from this activity, we can measure the magnetic field. We may also measure magnetic field from magnetic material, which is not generated by the electric currents. This is a very special field, but I'll give you brief examples. For instance, there may be some ferromagnetic particles in the lungs of the workers who do welding without any shield of the breathing, and that the ferromagnetic particles may be measured. We can do this other way around. We can feed electromagnetic energy to the body. If we feed an electric field or electric current, we do electric stimulations. We may also introduce a magnetic impulse, which generates stimulation, magnetic stimulation. Or we can magnetize these ferromagnetic particles. These are also applied as electrotherapy or magnetotherapy. Uh, that's also a possibility. Then there is a third possibility. We may feed or apply an electric or magnetic field to the body, which is of so low intensity that it does not stimulate or activate the tissue. So the tissue stays passive. But we measure how much it attenuates in the tissue, which means that if we feed an electric impulse, electric current, we measure the electric impedance of the body, or the tissue. Or we may do a magnetic measurement of the electric impedance. Or we may do magnetic measure, measurement of magnetic susceptibility. These are the three by three subdivisions of bioelectromagnetism. Mr. Maxwell introduced the Maxwell's equation, which you certainly everyone know very well, which tells what is the relationship between electricity and magnetism. And they are strong equations. The nature obeys and follows these equations. You cannot break them. They are strong equations, which means that all these subfields in the horizontal direction are strongly, closely connected to each other. And now I tell you something important. Well, actually, everything what I tell you is important. But I tell you now something extremely important. And that is that there do exist also a principle of reciprocity which was introduced by Hermann Ludwig Ferdinand von Helmholtz in 1853. And I'm very happy and proud to be in the Helmholtz Institute. Which one of you knows well what is the principle of reciprocity? You are in the Helmholtz Institute. You should know that. Well, I agree. Very seldom the students know principle of reciprocity even though it is a universal, extremely important principle, very important principle. You will get this information during this course. Please be sure. Principle of reciprocity ties all these subfields together in the vertical direction. And now, when we have two strong, unavoidable, strong laws of nature, one which ties all these nine subfields in the horizontal direction, and another one which joins them in the vertical direction, it means that all the subfields of bioelectromagnetism are strongly 
connected together, which makes the discipline of bioelectromagnetism very solid. This is not usually understood. <coughs> this is not usually understood. I'm afraid that there are no other lecturing courses in the world which emphasizes this principle. And principle of reciprocity is very seldom used in connection of bioelectric and biomagnetic phenomena, except in my research group. And that is and was the reason, I will tell you later on, that is the reason why we were able to solve several fundamental problems in bioelectromagnetism. Other colleagues didn't. I used to say that the straightforward method may be used in solving half of the problems. And the principle of reciprocity may be used for solving the other half of the problems. And we used principle of reciprocity and we were able to solve the other half of the problems. Well, we can say so, and it, it's quite about so. So you will learn principle of reciprocity. And it will be important for you. Anyhow, from these two principles, it follows a consequence that all these subfields, as I told, are strongly connected to each other. And in theory, yes, this is theory, if you know the situation in one of these subfields, with Maxwell's equations and principle of reciprocity, you should be able to calculate what is the situation in all other eight subdivisions. Think how important that is. Well, that is theory. When we come to practice, I will teach you why it is not in practice so simple and always possible. But this is it, in theory. But when understanding this, it helps you to understand the whole solid discipline of bioelectromagnetism. I don't give you uh, small pieces of the Swedish Smirgos board. I give you, tell you how the whole entity works. That's what you will learn. Here are some examples of the bio, uh, of the subdivisions. Measuring electric field, ECG, that you certainly know well. Making electric stimulation, that is, uh, defibrillation is one example. Measurement of electric impedance, this is an important uh, application area of, of this institute, impedance cardiography. Measuring the magnetic field of the heart, which is magnetocardiography. Magnetic stimulation. For instance, stimulation, magnetic stimulation of the brain. And measuring impedance with magnetic methods. So you see these subfields. Here I show another view to all these three by three subfields. They are the same subfields of bioelectromagnetism, which I did show you in the previous slide. But here it is shown some theory, and I will uh, explain you about this theory in a bit more detail. So let's take the upper left corner. Measurement of electric fields. First, let us study the distribution of the measurement sensitivity of the lead. What do I mean with this? Here we have a body. This is a body. A simplified human body, for instance. Body anyhow. Volume conductor. We connect two electric wires to the body. They form a lead. And we study what is the sensitivity, measurement sensitivity of this lead to sources locating in various locations in the volume conductor. 
So we map this sensitivity. How, we, how do we do it? We do it simply with calibration. And we have to do this calibration in three dimensions. Why? Therefore, that the body is not a slab. It is a three-dimensional body. Therefore, we need the three uh, coordinate axes. Let us select an arbitrary point here. We place, for calibration purpose, we place here a unit current source. Whichever unit you have, but a unit current source in the direction of x-axis. It is placed here. And then we measure what is the voltage in the lead. And the reading of the voltmeter we place on the x-axis. Now we have calibrated in direction of x-axis. We know that the unit current source generates such a signal. We repeat this in the direction of y-axis and measure the signal and place the reading on the coordinate. And the same in the direction of z-axis. Now we have the measurement sensitivities calibrated in all three coordinate axis directions. You know from vector algebra that these three vectors on the coordinate axes may be united to a single vector in the space, whose components they are. Now, this vector, we call it J sub L E, uh, we place it here. You see, it is now placed here on the, in the volume conductor, to the point what we are studying. Now, this includes the information of the measurement sensitivity in, in the all three coordinate directions. Which means that if we place here an arbitrary current source, the signal which comes here is a dot product of the sensitivity vector and the source vector. That it is. This is the story. I'm sure you understand this. This is just, firstly, it is linearity, a calibration, and thirdly, uh, we just combine, this is superposition, we combine these three components. We may repeat this procedure to several other points in the volume conductor and place the corresponding sensitivity vectors to those points. Now you have an image how the measurement sensitivity of this measurement lead behaves in the volume conductor. You have an image. You see that, aha, uh -huh, that's the way it behaves. Depending where the source is, we get the signal J sub L E dot J I to the lead. You understand the problem. Of course, you may get measurement sensitivity vectors to any other point with just the interpolation. You don't need to repeat the procedure to every, every point. <coughs> now I take a second problem. Let us feed a unit current to the lead. We have the same volume conductor and the same electrode, same lead. And we feed a unit current, which is a stimulation current. And you may intuitively think that, aha, uh -huh, this is the way the current distributes in the volume conductor. Just intuitively see that uh, that's how it goes. I can display or illustrate this current distribution by not using current flow lines but using current density vectors, which means that the current density is proportional to the density of the current flow lines, and its orientation is a tangent 
of the flow line. So these two illustrations show exactly the same phenomenon with different display method. Up to this point, I'm sure that you have understood everything. It is very simple, very rational, very logical, no difficulties. Sure? Yes. Say yes. It's very simple. But the next step is difficult. Please do not even try to understand it. If you claim that you understand it, I'm sure that you understand it wrong. Please do not try to understand it. What is the next step? The next step is that our friend Hermann von Helmholtz said that this field of measurement sensitivity vectors is exactly the same as this field of current density vectors. It is not about, it is not something almost, not close by or so. It is exactly, exactly the same. So please believe me. Please believe me. This is a fact. You don't understand it. It is not obvious. It is very difficult to think of why it is so. You may start thinking perhaps that, that uh, the measurement sensitivity is strong here close to the electrode and the current density shall also be uh, strong close to the electrode. And you may go point by point. But the fact that they are exactly the same is impossible to understand. Our friend Hermann was a smart guy. He defined this theory 150 years ago. And he was forgotten, forgotten 420 years. And then Richard McPhee, or 110 years, Richard McPhee rediscovered this. And I found from Richard McPhee's work that, wow, this is something interesting. And I fell in love with principle of reciprocity. Please do the same. Okay, bioelectric phenomena. That was in nutshell the target of this course. And I, I will say that uh, maybe you don't completely fully understand what I said, but after this course, you will be very familiar with this and you understand how it all came. And when understanding this, what I said, you know a lot. You know a lot of bioelectromagnetism. You will be able to understand what you measure from the body. You will be able to understand how to do the impedance measurements. You will be possible to understand how to measure the electricity, how the magnetism, and so on and so on. Everything are connected together. That's it. That's it. So, bioelectric phenomena, activation of nerve and muscle cells is associated with a bioelectric phenomenon. Well, I think you know this. Uh, ions, various ions, uh, mainly sodium and potassium and other chloride and others as well, do flow through the cell membrane, through uh, channels, which will be open and close, and it is even possible to measure the electric current through a single channel. I'll come to this patch clamp technology. And they are digital, these channels. They are either closed or open, closed or open. This is a current uh, uh, measured flowing through a channel. This is the patch clamp technology, one uh, Nobel Prize worth work with a very tiny uh, glass micropipette it is sucked from the cell membrane a piece inside that and it is possible to measure the current through a single ionic channel i come to this i come to this <clears throat> i'm sure you know this uh, in principle but i i still still show this this slide about how the bioelectric signal is generated. This is, uh, these timescales are now from the cardiac muscle cell, 
but in principle it is the same in the skeletal muscle or in the nerve cell. In resting state, it is measured from inside the muscle fiber, which is shown here is a muscle fiber, it is opened, a negative potential compared to the interstitial space. There are potassium ions more inside than outside and sodium ions more outside than inside. Then there are channels, which I did show in the previous slide, sodium and potassium ion channels on the cell membrane. Time is going now from the left to the right. And there starts a process. Why? I tell you later on. A process which is called depolarization. The cell is polarized, minus uh, 60, 70, 80 millivolts, which depends on the cell. The polarization is going away, it is depolarized. How? It is depolarized so that the channel opens, see carefully, it opens, and because there are more sodium ions outside, there is a diffusional force, which forces them to flow inwards. You see, they are flowing there. They have positive charge, which makes the inside more positive, as you see, it goes more positive. Thereafter takes place the process called repolarization. The cell will be again polarized. It happens so that the potassium ion channels open, you see it, voila. There are more potassium ions inside. The diffusion of force is from inside to out. Potassium ions flow from inside to out, as you see and take positive charge from inside to out, making the inside back negative. This is the bioelectric signal, basically. Then there is in the cell membrane a mechanism, so-called... Okay, then the ionic channels close, okay. Uh, the mechanism which is called sodium-potassium ion pump, which restores the concentrations of the sodium and potassium ions. This is the process. This is the bioelectric phenomena to which everything what I lecture for the term is based. Applications on this we can see, for instance, a high-resolution electroencephalogram. That's from my lab, 256 channel EEG. Electrocardiogram, which I did show you again. And then, from bioelectric phenomena, we switch to biomagnetic phenomena. According to the basic laws of electromagnetism, the Max Maxwell equations, in connection with electric current, there always exists a magnetic field, which means that bioelectric activity always generates also a biomagnetic field. So simple. Here is an example of the biomagnetic measurement. This is a magnetocardiogram. It is placed a very, very, very sensitive detector or magnetic field above the chest, above the heart of the subject, and it detects the magnetic field generated by the electric currents flowing in the cardiac muscle. What kind of properties bioelectric and biomagnetic signals do have? Information spreads immediately throughout the whole body. When you think how the humoral regulation, the chemical uh, uh, regulation in the body takes place, it takes a lot of time before uh, the various pharmacological agents are spreading all around the body. Electric and magnetic signals spread with a, almost with the speed of light. Measurement is non-invasive. The patients appreciate this. Many patients are cut with a knife or stuck with a needle and so on and so on. They don't like that. But bioelectric and biomagnetic measurements are mostly, almost all, are non-invasive. Made on the surface or even outside the body. 
the source of the signal may be solved with desired accuracy, provided that you do not desire too much. The signals have temporarily and spatially controlled stimulation, may be done with this uh, phenomena. And side effects are minimal and well known. This is important because uh, you apparently know that in the modern pharmacological industry, most of the costs do not go for finding the positive effects of the pharmaceutical agents, the medicines, but for avoiding the negative effects. Bioelectric and biomagnetic phenomena do not have or have very minimal side effects. My colleague Johann Gottlob Krüger from University of Halle said in 1743, all things must have a usefulness, that is certain. Since electricity must have a usefulness, and we have seen that it cannot be looked for either in theology or in law, there is obviously nothing left but medicine. I appreciate his comment. Uh, this first lecture is this kind of introduction uh, and a lot of history I will give you, but before I give the history, I, I will just entertain you a little bit. Please do not take this too seriously. I make you some questions. Would you, sir, like to have an electromechanical motor with turbo? Would you like to have? Okay, good. Would you like to have a stereo video camera? Yes, okay, good, very good. And you, a stereo microphone? Okay, fine. Would you like to have a personal computer? Okay, that's fine. But you do not have to buy them because you have them already. The heart. The heart is an electromechanical motor. It is electronically controlled. It has two chambers with a turbo. It is maintenance free. During the lifetime of about 75 years, it makes three billion cycles. Think that. Lot of work. The human eyes, they are a stereo video camera. The resolution is about one million pixels. In my mobile phone, I have two million pixels in the camera, but I have two eyes. <laughs> it has an automatic sensitivity control. Sensitivity is about one light quantum. There is no smaller light than one single quantum. It is unbelievable. In favorable conditions, the human eye may be or is able to detect even a single light quantum. Unbelievable. Its dynamic range is about 100 dB. And it has a computer-controlled linearization. This screen don't have it. It is not linear. The human ears form a stereo microphone. Frequency range is from 16 hertz to 22 kilohertz. Automatic sensitivity control. It detects even the thermal movement of one single air molecule, which is touching the eardrum. There is no smaller sound. That is like a sound quantum. Unbelievable. Dynamic range is over 120 dB. Distortion is zero because it is computer controlled. And finally, the personal computer is the human brain. It has about 10 to 11 electronic processing elements. It has associative memory about 200 megabytes. It has parallel processing. All you know that parallel processing is the most powerful processing. It has operation system, Humanic, it has data input with video camera and video microphone. 
data output with speech synthesizer and electromechanical quality writer. Capacity is altogether about 10 megabytes per second. Unbelievable. Because these instruments operate electrically, their operation and operation failures can be investigated electrically and magnetically. If their normal operation is disturbed, they can be controlled with external electric or magnetic controllers, which are called stimulation, stimulators. So, as I said, bioelectromagnetism is a discipline that examines the electric, electromagnetic and magnetic phenomena which arise in biological tissues. Isn't it fascinating? Yes, it is. I go now to the history. I like the history. It is called Short History of Bioelectromagnetism. I'm afraid that this is a bit long, but anyhow. I start with the first written documents and first experiments in bioelectromagnetism. And I ask you, when was made the first written document on bioelectromagnetism? Who knows? When was made the first written document? Any suggestion? Who? Please say it loud. Yes? Mm -hmm. And when was that? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the answer which I usually get. That this is not a bad answer, but it is not correct answer. An Egyptian hieroglyph 4000 BC, which was 6000 years ago, I show you, this is not from, from that, uh, this is uh, symbolizes the situation. It was written in the hieroglyph that about a fish that releases the troops. What does it mean? It means that there were fishermen on the river Nile, and they were fishing with their nets, and when they got a fish, an electric fish, that gave electric shocks, and then the fishermen gave just a net away because he got the electric shocks. So this electric fish released the troops of the fish. That is documented in the hieroglyph in the uh, 6,000 years ago. Here's another from the tomb of T of the 5th dynasty of Sakkarax in 2750 BC. There's also illustrated the same fish. So this is this beautiful catfish, Malapterus electricus, so charming fish. <laughs> These electric phenomena were applied for medicine also. There is a document about, uh, in 46, Anno Domino, Scribonius Largus, who was physician to Roman Emperor Claudius, used a torpedo fish for curing headache and gout. But the patient had a lot of headache, they took a torpedo fish, placed it on the head of the patient, and got electric shocks. I said, okay, okay, I'm just fine, please take it away. <laughs> so it was very, very effective. <laughs> Greek philosophers, Thales and Aristotle, experimented with amber and recognized that it attracts light objects. I come to this very shortly. Actually, the first document which I would say is scientific, was written by William Gilbert in 1600. He was a physician to Queen Elizabeth. Here is a cover page of Gilbert's book. It is found in Project Gutenberg on the internet, the whole book, or the text of the book, not, not uh, 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 in, uh, on, in the same visual form. So Gilbert re rediscovered the attracting effect of amber. When the, what is that? When taking a piece of amber, rubbing it to the cloth, then it attracts light objects. And that is uh, static electricity. Amber is in Greek language, as you can read here, oops, is electron, that is amber. You know what is amber? It is in German, it is Bernstein. 
So from that name of Bernstein, Greek name, has come all the words electricity, electronics, and so on. So when in this university, the Department of uh, Electronics uh, should be a Fakultät für Bernstein. I tell you something, I visited in Minneapolis this Backen Library and Museum. I make a pilgrimage visit to this museum. I show you something. It was established by Mr. Backen. Who was Mr. Backen? Earl Backen. This is an American business story. He started as a young boy in his family garage making electronics, and that is, he established a company, Medtronic, in 1949, and started to do pacemakers and several electromedical equipments. You certainly know the company, Medtronic. And he made a lot of money, and when he retired, he didn't thought what about to do with the money, and he established this Backen Library and Museum in Minneapolis, which is a fantastic museum. I visited that, here is a director and librarian. And uh, in that museum, you can find a lot of uh, historical books on this topic and a lot of historical equipments. I show you examples on that. But let's go to Mr. Gilbert back. In this book, De Magnete, he did show a detector of electric field. This is not a, a compass needle. It is not sensitive for magnetic field, but for electric field. And here it is on the page of the book. I took this photo myself with my camera from the book. I, I had a book in my hands. It was a fantastic feeling. And you know what are these? What is that black spot and that there? They are holes which were eaten by a bookworm. The first electric machine is uh, uh, said to be this device which was developed by the Otto von Gürke, a mayor on Magdeburg. It was what it is. It is a sphere made from sulfur. Uh, it is said that it is of the size of the uh, head of the baby. Here is a, a modern replica of that. When rotating it and rubbing it with the cloth, it generates static electricity. Here is another device by Francis Hawksby. Here is a, a glass a sphere, and it is with a pump, it is taken the air from the inside. It's rotated very fast and rubbed with a cloth, which generates static electric field. And as a consequence, in the low pressure air, there are generated fluorescent light because of the, uh, the electric field. So actually, Francis Hawksby invented these fluorescent light tubes. At those times, electricity was not a real science, it was more entertainment. Here is an example of Stephen Gray's experiment. For instance, the uh, people entertained each other with this experiment. There's a lady is uh, uh, hanging from this kind of silk rope, so she's insulated. Here, this gentleman has, has a lacquer uh, stick, which is uh, statically uh, charged. Uh, this lady here on the right is charged, and she's touching the almost the nose of this lady, and there is a spark going on. Please look very carefully. Yeah. Please look it again. Yeah. Uh, I show you something which is more scientific. You mentioned Luigi Galvani. That is popularly known. But it is not popularly known that 130 years earlier than Luigi Galvani, Mr. Jan Swammerdam made electric bimetallic stimulation. He was uh, Jan Swammerdam. I tell you something about Jan Swammerdam for a certain reason. I gave a talk in the medical conference last autumn in Sevilla, talk 
Did Jan Swammedam make the first bimetallic electric stimulation of 100 years before Luigi Galvani? Uh, I got the idea of this work uh, from reading the book of uh, Rosebottom, and I asked Jussi Honkonen to do a Master of Science thesis on this topic, and he suggested uh, succeeded very well, and this is quite interesting. I go a bit f faster through. So Jan Swammedam did live 1637-1680. This illustration is often given, or usually given, to illustrate Jan Swammedam, but that is not true. He is not Jan Swammedam. There is no illustration about Jan Swammedam uh, available. Uh, he was born in Amsterdam, and uh, let's go further on. It's also believed that that gentleman there would be Jan Swammedam in this very famous painting of Rembrandt, but he is not either. Uh, he was very interested in insects. He made very accurate anatomical drawings of insects. He was one of the first people to use a microscope. Here is his main book, which was published posthumously, Johannes Swammedam Biblia Nature. And this book is in Backen Museum, and I could keep it in my hands. There is an example of an anatomical illustration made by Swammedam, but more important, interesting for us is what's going down here. What's going there? Here is Swammedam doing something very interesting, experiment. The experiment is that it was assumed at his time, that the contraction of muscle is a consequence of flowing a liquid, a succus nervus spirituosus, or animal spirits, to the muscle along the tube, which we now know is a motoric nerve. It was thought that there's something flowing in the muscle, and therefore it comes thicker. Jan Swammedam wanted to study that. Is this true? Is there something flowing? He made this kind of experiment. This is a frog sartorius muscle in the glass tube, and there's a very tiny capillary tube going up there. He closed this with a piston, and there is a brass ring, and here is a, a silver wire around the uh, motoric nerve, and he did pull this silver wire against this brass ring to stimulate the muscle. He thought it is a mechanical stimulation. What happened? It was stimulated, it was uh, contracting, but this small droplet of water in the capillary did not move, which indicates that the volume changed constant. Well, actually it is self-evident that it is constant because this is cut, this nerve, there's nothing can flow through the nerve. But anyhow, that was his experiment. Why is this so interesting? Okay, it is here described, the whole story, sorry. I told it already. Robotom and Suskin, in their book Electricity and Medicine, History of Their Interaction, speculated that this exam ex experiment perhaps did, was not stimulation, mechanical irritation, but with the bimetallic stimulation. And we, in this diploma thesis, Master of Science thesis, we demonstrated that that is true. And uh, so he, on Swammedam experiment, he did pull the silver wire down, and the nerve did touch this brass ring, and there is silver electrolyte contact, about 150 millivolts potential due to the different uh, electrolyte. Here is about 300 millivolts, and silver brass contact is zero, and finally there is about 150 millivolts uh, potential generated, which stimulates the nerve bimetallically, activation proceeds to the muscle, and the muscle contracts. That is the process. And we studied the standard electrode potentials. I don't spend too much time on here. It was studied that it is theoretically possible. It's about 165 millivolts, the potential difference. We studied that 50 millivolts is enough for stimulating the, the nerve. 
and uh, uh, then uh, let's go on we made experiments we took uh, uh, swam madam apparently used a common frog rana temporaria in his experiment but because common frog is protected animal species in finland we had to use oriental firebell toad in this experiment well you may guess that when i was a young boy we were experimenting with the frogs without knowing that they are protected animals but in scientific article we couldn't use the normal frog and uh, let's go on here is the uh, muscle of, of the frog and here is Jussi Honkonen's hand and he is pulling this silver wire and the motoric nerve goes there he's pulling it down and uh, then when it is pulled down the muscle contracts so he was able to generate the contraction experimentally and we theoretically demonstrated that it is very easily possible to do that stimulation so we proved that Jan Swammedam made the story of Galvani 150 years earlier about Galvani I appreciate Mr. Galvani of course very much uh, he made experiments uh, where he has this kind of electric machine and he had uh, uh, with a, with a scalpel he was touching the frog preparate on the table and he got the stimulation and actually what does it mean this was in 1781 this is not the bimetallic stimulation but the electric field was radiating from this machine to his metal knife and the energy stimulated the the, the uh, frog so Mr. Galvani invented the radio. He was a real biomedical engineer. But this is the experiment, the experiment, which he made a little bit later. The classical study, which he made in, uh, when he studied effect of atmospheric electricity to frog muscle, frog preparations were suspended from an iron railing by brass hooks, uh, in his house here is another illustration on that and when the frog leg touched the iron then it got the bimetallic stimulation and it was moving here is another example which he made with copper and zinc uh, uh, arc and got the stimulation this is popularly known luigi galvani wrote a booklet viribus electricitatis in motu musculari about this experiment it is printed, in my knowledge, only 11 examples, 11 pieces of this booklet. And four or five of those booklets are in Bakken Museum. And I had the possibility to keep it in my hands. <laughs> I, I skip here. I skip here. I come. Conclusion. Jan Swammedam should be credited for the first bimetallic stimulation which he made in 1664 and also as an inventor of radio. Let's go on. Okay, that is about the Calvani story. I go on. Okay. The Leiden Yard was invented by Ewald. Georg Kleist and Peter van Muschenbroek about the same time, independently, very same time. So it was a storage of electricity. electricity. Uh, Alessandro Giuseppe Antonio Anastasio Volta invented the voltaic pile, which is an early battery, being able to generate continuous electric current. I visited in Como, in Italy, the Tempio Voltiano, which is dedicated to this uh, scientist uh, at those times they made quite cruel experiments with electric stimulation galvani's nephew uh, uh, sorry volta's nephew giovanni aldini tried to resuscitate dead people not so not so nice works so let's skip uh, electrotherapy was made also here is a st electrostatic generator here is a leiden yard and stimulated the girl who has paralyzed hand. These kind of experiments were made. Michael Faraday uh, invented the induction coil 1831 
and these different electrotherapy equipments were sold very much, even though they didn't have too much effect. Uh, Jack Darson Wall made this kind of grand solenoid, uh, which uh, generates effect called magnetophosphenes. There is a coil, 32 amperes with 42 hertz, and the gentleman is standing inside, and the electromagnetic field is irritating the retina of his eye, which he senses as, as a phenomena of light in front of, because it's very sensitive to electric, electric field, and therefore it's called magnetophosphenes. That is in Bakken Museum. Hans Christian Ørsted made a very important experiment in 1819. He was a professor of physics in University of Copenhagen, and uh, here is a, a painting of him. Here is a magnetic compass, uh, naval compass from the ship, and there is a wire going above it, and when there is electric current going through the wire, the compass needle turns. So he, this is his experiment. Actually, he made his first experiment during his lecture in front of the students. He didn't know whether it works or not, and he succeeded to get it working. So this is Christian, Hans Christian Ørsted's experiment. He had a very primitive battery. Here is a magnetic needle and a wire going there. Electric current is flowing in the wire, and it induces a magnetic field around it, and the magnetic needle turns to the direction of the field. So what he made, he invented experimentally the connection between electric current and magnetic field. That was his invention. Christopher Schweiger uh, made uh, several coil turns, strengthened the effect, and uh, Leopold Nobili was smart to do a differential measurement dis system called a static galvanometer, because this method, this device, was not sensitive enough uh, for finding very, very slow electric cur currents, because the Earth's static magnetic field was turning the needle. So this is the first differential measurement system. Leopold Nobili placed on the same axis two compass needles in opposite directions, so it is neutral to the Earth's static field, and coils around this. And this device, here's another version of it, it is possible to use in detecting the muscle impulse made by Carlo Matteucci. And nerve impulse made by Emil Henrik de Bois Raymond. I skip here. The father of clinical electroencephalography was Hans Berger, who was the first one to detect the electric field generated by the brain, measured on the scalp. Many other scientists have made with electrodes from inside the brain before, but this was made on the scalp. And he was very optimistic about the possibilities to read what the patient is thinking, and we still share his optimism. That's too complicated a process. Augustus Woller, an English scientist, was the first one to detect the electric field of the heart. He got a lot of help from his good friend Jimmy here. Jimmy was an experiment uh, patient, uh, standing on these uh, uh, vessels, there were some uh, saline and electric wires going on there, and this is the ECG of Jimmy. This is one of the first recordings, if not the first recording of ECG. This is not the ECG. This is mechanical apex cardiogram or the movement of the apex of the heart. The electrocardiogram is the contour between white and black here because it is measured with a capillary electrometer which was very unsensitive and un non-linear device. Uh, invented by Gabriel Lippmann who got the Nobel Prize, not from this work, but he got it from color photography later on. Now I show you one illustration made by Augustus Woller, and you will see this illustration several times later on, because this is important. He did map the electric field on the chest of the patient, 
generated by the heart. And what he found is that the heart is a very dipolar source. And still today, even though the technology has developed and we have a lot of computer programs and whichever, 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 if you or your parents need to go to hospital for problems in the heart, it is measured the electric dipole of the heart. That's what it is measured. Wilhelm Eithoven is father of the clinical electrocardiogram. He got the Nobel Prize in 1924. He in, did not invent the string galvanometer, but he developed the method so that it was easy to use. At those times, there were no amplifiers for electric currents. Therefore, it was necessary to take as much electric energy from the body as possible. Therefore, it was needed large surface electrodes and they were obtained by using vessels which had saline, salt water, and the object, the person placed hands and one leg to these vessels and got as much energy as possible to the string galvanometer here. These are maybe a little bit oversized switches here. They could be used for power lines, but they are used for this purpose. So this practical issue that the energy of electric current of the heart is taken with as big electrodes as possible, obtained by placing the hands to the vessels, is the reason why still today in the uniclinic here, ECG is measured basically from hands and left leg. Still that reason. So he got the Nobel Prize in 24. Hubert Mann, Hubert Mann invented the monocardiogram, which is uh, uh, or, origin of vector cardiography. At those times, all ECG recordings were dominated with the so-called Eindhoven lead, leads Eindhoven triangle, is right hand, left hand, and foot. And when the signals were measured from these three leads and projected here to the center, it can be represented, all these three signals, with a single monocardiogram, which is uh, a very preliminary vector cardiogram. Actually, he is a, here is a problem of polarity. It was understood incorrectly, the polarity. The polarity should be rotated around and then projected the electric signal from these three signals to the monocardiogram in the center. And here is the 12 lead ECG, which I, to which I come a bit later. I go to the modern electrophysiological studies of neural cells. <coughs> Charles Scott Sherrington received a Nobel Prize from his works. He uh, defined or explained the operation of chemical synapse, which is a connection between a nerve cell and another nerve cell or the muscle cell. I come to this later. Electroretinogram is an effect, uh, example of bioelectric signals. When the light comes to the eye, it is projected to the retina and it is possible with the electrode on the, uh, on the surface of the eye to record this kind of electric signal, which is known that it originated in that way from the rods and cones and different layers of cells. I have difficulties to understand why this retina is in that way. If I had been asked to design a retina, I had placed it the other way around, so that the light comes first to these light sensitive cells, rods and cones. But the God had other thoughts. What is interesting from the data processing point of view here is that the signal does not go directly from the rods and cones along optic nerve to the eye, uh, to, the, to the brain. But there is a distributed computer in the retina. These layers of cells pre-process the image 
before the signal is sent to the visual center of the brain. That is a smart thing. Very smart to process it immediately just at the side of the Rochester cones. That is fantastic. I may have come in more detail to Ragnar Granit if there is time at the end of this course, but I just mentioned briefly here that there was a theory by Helmholtz again. Mr. Helmholtz comes many times to, to entertain us. Helmholtz and Young, a theory of color vision. They had a theory that there must be three different kind of sensors which detect the three different colors of the light. And the combination of these signals gives the person the uh, sensation of color image. Ragnar Granit, a Finnish born scientist, made in Finland before moving to Sweden as his uh, MD thesis, a study with animals, and found that that is true. There are different kind of cones which are sensitive in the, in the retina, sensitive to blue, green, and red. And combination of these signals gives us the uh, sensation of color. This is nice because you know that in the projector, on the computer screen, on the camera, and, and whichever, there are three different colors detected. That is the same principle in the modern electronics as is in our eye. The first detection of biomagnetic field was made by Gerhard Boyle and Richard McPhee in 1963. They had two these kind of detectors. They were ferromagnetic cores and copper wire was turned two million turns to each of these uh, 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 sensing coil systems. And this signal was sent to amplifier and it was uh, uh, plotted with a printer. Or, or, uh, and this was published as the first magnetocardiogram ever in American Heart Journal. Well, actually, this is not the magnetocardiogram. McPhee was a smart guy, but he made a fun fundamental mistake. What is the signal? This is the first time derivative of the magnetocardiogram. So the signal which is induced to these coils is proportional to the rate of change of the magnetic field, not to the magnetic field. So to get the magnetocardiogram, this signal must be integrated. Very uh, fundamental point. Here is a simultaneous electrocardiogram and magnetocardiogram, and you find that there is one deflection more in the magnetocardiogram, already indicating that it is a time derivative. The first recording of the magnetoencephalogram, the magnetic field generated by the brain, was made by David Cohan in Boston, MIT. Here is one of the very, very first uh, images detected ever, with what he made. He had this kind of very, very heavy magnetically shielded room. There is a quite modern detector, squid detector inside. That was the first signals in my understanding were not made by squid detector, but uh, induction coil magnetometer. I come to these questions also. About the theoretical contributions, Benjamin Franklin invented the co concepts of positive and negative electricity. And now we come to Hermann Hel von Helmholtz. He was a smart guy. He made several fundamental contributions. He measured, found that actions are processes of nerve cell bodies. He invented the conservation of energy, which is the first law of thermodynamics. He measured the conduction velocity of nerve impulse. He invented the concepts of double layer source and solid angle theorem. And he invented to define the principle of superposition, and he invented and defined the reciprocity theorem. Principle of superposition is quite self-evident, but reciprocity theorem is not. 
he found the insolvability of the inverse problem and independence of flux and vortex sources and Helmholtz coils. Just to mention some of his contributions, he was a smart guy. You should be proud to be in Helmholtz Institute. Mr. Maxwell, quite soon after the invention of Ørsted, Maxwell formulated the theoretical equations to describe the connection of electric and magnetic fields and the basic laws of electricity. Mr. Nernst, Walter Hermann Nernst, received a Nobel Prize in 1920 from inventing or defining the Nernst equation. Please be sure that I will teach you that very carefully. Then about the history of bioelectromagnetism uh, summary. In the internet or in the book you find a summary which describes uh, the theoretical contributions, instrumentation or simulators and detectors, and stimulation and measurements. I do not go to the details, of course it, it's difficult, difficult to see so small text on the screen, but you can find it from the book. This starts from 1600, the time scale is from left to right, 1600 from the uh, book De Magnete by uh, Gilbert, and uh, Gilbert is shown here, and here is just shown that uh, in 1664 Swammerdam made the first bimetallic stimulation, even it is thought that it was Galvani in 1781. No, it was Swammerdam first. From S Galvani's work, uh, Galvani's bimetallic stimulation, we can go to galvanometer invented by Schweiger, then to a static galvanometer by Nobili, to Matteucci, who recorded the first muscle impulse, and de Bois-Raymond, 1842, the nerve impulse. The time span is surprisingly short. When thinking at those times, there were no internet, no email, and so on. The information was uh, moving quite slowly, but the, the fellows were very active at those times. Here is uh, shown uh, that the mechanism of color vision was studied and found in his doctoral thesis by Ragnar Granit, and later on he developed microelectrode, which is important issue as well. There are different eras of electrical and electromagnetic stimulation. Benjamin Franklin used static electricity, Galvani direct current, F Michael Faraday induction coil shocks, Jack Darson Wall radio frequency current, and so on. I want to emphasize during these lectures that uh, there are several Nobel Prizes awarded in bioelectromagnetism. Just to point out how important discipline this is. Starting from Jacobus van Hoff, and the latest one is 2003, Peter Ager and Roderick McKinnon. 29 Nobel laureates, 16 prizes. And during these lectures, I mentioned some other Nobel prizes which are not given to bioelectromagnetism. Lippmann, Planck, Einstein, Dirac, Gabor, McCormack, and Hausfield. Seven laureates, six prizes, altogether 36. Nobel Prize winners, 22 prizes. I think quite an important discipline. And the Ragnar Granit. I may have some minutes for Ragnar Granit. He received the Nobel Prize in 1967 with Hartline and Wald for their discoveries concerning the primary physiological and chemical visual processes in the eye. I'll show just a few slides on Ragnar Granit. Uh, that this is his childhood home, not very luxurious. It is in in suburb of Helsinki, at that time outside the city of Helsinki. He went to school. He was uh, he was born. He, he, his family is from from Korpo, which is the southwestern uh, coast 
of Finland, the archipelago, where all the families at those times were fishermen or sea captains or sailors, except Ragnar Granit's father was a forester, and therefore he moved to close to Helsinki and made some forest evaluations. They were Swedish-speaking Finnish people. In Finland, we have two official languages, Finnish and Swedish, and the minority of Finnish people are speaking Swedish. So he was Swedish-speaking uh, family. He went in Helsinki to the Swedish high school and got matriculation in 1919. He went to University of Helsinki to study medicine, and here is the Institute of Physiology, where he made studies of this uh, color vision. The experimental animals are there, and Mr. Granit is working here. This is a nice picture of his, his uh, laboratory. I have worked uh, a couple of years in the Institute of Physiology. I am not sure whether I have been working in the same room as Ragnar Granit, but anyhow, uh, quite close to him. And this is the electroretinogram, which I mentioned. He invented the metal microelectrode, which was small enough to be used in detecting electric signals from the uh, rods and cones of retina. These are brain cells in this illustration. So this instrumentation was necessary to make the experiments. And this I already did show you this result. This is his thesis. I think you can read it better than I do. Farben transformation und Farben contrast. Experimental, experimental Beiträge zur Theorie der Transformation. Akademische Abhandlung von Ragnar Granit. Before the World War II, all doctoral theses in Finland were written in German language, and after the World War II, it was shifted to English, which is now the dominating international language for science. Here is his family. He has one son. Uh, here is the house where he was living in uh, southern Helsinki. And uh, the president of Finland, Koi Stolberg, was living in the same house. And Ragnar Granit Foundation placed uh, this kind of placket on the wall showing that Ragnar Granit was also living in that house. In 1941, after the Winter War, before the Continuation War, Ragnar Granit moved to Sweden. He had traveled quite much before that in England and in the United States, and he got an invitation to Harvard University. He had already bought the tickets to travel there, but then he got an invitation from Stockholm to Karolinska Institute. And he decided to go there because he would be closer to Finland. And why he did want to move out from Finland, at those times, just after the Winter War, especially the financial situation for making science was really not so good. And he was Swedish speaking. It was easy for him to move to Karolinska because he got an invitation. He, uh, he was an active sailor. Actually, he was sailing with his own private sailing boat from Korpo to uh, Stockholm. Here's some of his books. He's visiting professor in several universities, an honorary doctor in several universities. And here is uh, several prizes. Here's uh, St. Vincent Prize in Academia de Medicina de Torino, which he received. And finally, in 1967, he received the Nobel Prize. And why so late? He received the Nobel Prize from the work of the color vision, which he made in Finland before moving to Sweden. But he received the Nobel Prize so late, therefore, that he was a member of the Nobel Committee because of his job in, in, in the Nobel Institute, in Karolinska Institute. And he was not able, of course, was not able to give a Nobel Prize to himself. So he received the Nobel Prize after retiring. Therefore, it is so difficult even to the Finnish people to understand that Ragnar Granit was a Finnish novelist because he was Swedish speaking and living in Finland as uh, Sweden and he received the prize so long time after moving from Sweden to Sweden from Finland. Therefore, when I found this that actually he might be a Finnish Nobel Prize winner and made some research on this, 
established the Ragnar Granit Institute and Ragnar Granit Foundation and made a lot of uh, uh, advertising and information about Ragnar Granit as a Finnish Nobelist. Now it is well accepted. Here is he receiving the Nobel Prize. Here he receives the academician title from President of Finland, Mauno Koivisto. He was speaker in the first Nordic meeting of medical and biological engineering in Helsinki in 1970. This was the first scientific conference which I attended. But I was not on the first row. I was a young student of technology. I was on the last row. So I didn't personally meet Ragnar Granit there. Here is his sailing boat. This kind of boat he used when sailing from Corpo to Stockholm. And some pictures of his uh, elderly times. He spent all the summers in the summer cottage or summer uh, house, which was in Corpo, where his family originates. He is buried to Corpo also. Here is his grave. Professor Ragnar Granit. I tell you that once I asked one of my cosmopolitan colleagues, what is your home country? He said, my home country is there where, where I would like to die and be buried. Ragnar Granit, well, he did not die in, in, in uh, Finland, he died in Stockholm, but he wanted to be buried to Corpo. So by soul, he felt himself to be Finnish all his life. Here are some web pages of Ragnar Granit Institute and Foundation. And if you go to Nobel, uh, Nobel Foundation page, Nobel Prize Org, there is uh, uh, text of all Nobel Prize winners on the page of Ragnar Granit. You find that links to other sources and sites on Ragnar Granit from Ragnar Granit Foundation and Ragnar Granit Institute. So Nobel Foundation uh, appreciates uh, Ragnar Granit Foundation and Institute. So I think the time is over now. I thank you very much for your interest and I hope that you were interested in the history of bioelectromagnetism and I will continue next week on the anatomy and physiology which is important and related to the bioelectric biomagnetic phenomenon. Thank you very much. <laughs>